Welcome back to Patient No Longer. We have a fantastic episode today. We have got a great guest. We've got a real heavyweight in healthcare. I am excited to introduce and speak with today, Dr. Gita Nayar. Dr. G, how are you today? I'm doing well. It's so great to, to see you again, Ryan. How are you? Well, we've seen each other a few times. We've bumped into each other now, so I, I feel like I know you, which is great. And uh, I think everyone listening will really feel like they know you after this. I mean, you're an expert. I think you have such an interesting intersection of talents. And so Dr. G is globally recognized in healthcare technology. So he's a leader in the industry, steering us towards some new and exciting things. You're the former chief medical officer of Salesforce and AT&T. You've been a consultant to many influential organizations across healthcare, focusing on new innovations, artificial intelligence, which I definitely want to talk to you about today, um, all to achieve wonderful and new and powerful health and business outcomes. You also serve on the board of the American Telemedicine Association. But what I really want to focus on to start is you've written a new book, and I love your title. I mean, I love it, but it, it scares me too. So it's probably a good title. <laughs> But the title of your new book is Dead Wrong, Diagnosing and Treating Healthcare's Misinformation Illness. This is a post-pandemic look at medical misinformation in the digital age. I want to dig in right there because your new book, Dead Wrong, it talks about misinformation. I also want to ask you the difference between misinformation and disinformation. I hear both, and I think they're getting used interchangeably when they shouldn't. But also, what do we need to do to fight misinformation in this age right now? What would you say to that? Well, first, again, thanks so much for having me, Ryan. So I think we start off with some definitions first. So misinformation is essentially information that's not factual and harmful and is being spread. Disinformation is the intentional spread of non-facts to harm, right? So really the biggest difference is harm, harmful intent. And so as far as what we need to be cognizant of, both as patients, both as, as docs, just as industry leaders in general, is number one, that it's out there. It's traveling six times faster than the facts because of the digital age that we're in. And we want to first make sure that we're not a promoter of it. So if we don't know the information that is coming to us, if we are not sure of it, we always want to validate it. We want to look at what is the source. We want to see if it is what is called evidence-based medicine and actually peer-reviewed in journals. And very simply put, you want to ask your doctor, right? You want to have a relationship with your doctor long before you're sick. And you want to ask the question, you know, I've been reading about diabetes. I've been reading about fertility, blood pressure, whatever it might be. And these are the places I'm going to. Is that right, doc? Is that where you go? So inviting that conversation, being cognizant of it. And most of us, again, are handed memes, sent things on WhatsApp, text, email, et cetera. And for the most part, we just forward it on, right? We, if we find it interesting, we tend to forward it on. But I think being very mindful of, hey, is this actually real as it relates to my health? And am I someone that should be the arbiter of passing on health information? Am I truly an expert or not? Let me check and validate with other experts out there. So those are just a few tips to be thoughtful of. And this is a conversation, Ryan, I'm often having with patients. So I very proactively will tell patients, hey, these are the sites I go to. These are the ones I recommend. And I do want you to be informed. I do want you to have shared decision-making, but that starts with the facts. That's so true. And you are a practicing physician. I didn't mention at the outset. So you're seeing patients, which I think is is such a great combination of that with your corporate experience. And what you say about memes is so true. Now, you know, I get memes from friends that are, you know, about sports or other things and healthcare is different. And really you focus so much of your work on misinformation as it applies to healthcare, where frankly, the stakes are much higher. You also have uh, mentioned healthcare and described it in some really interesting ways. And I want to focus on one of those in particular. You've described healthcare as unreachable to sort of the average consumer, this average person who doesn't have a lot of knowledge, doesn't always know what's right, what's wrong. Um, so when you say healthcare is unreachable to many consumers and patients, what do you mean by that? So look, I know we all want to forget the pandemic, and yet we can't stop talking about it, right? So the pandemic was unfortunately a really good example of this. We developed life-saving vaccines in nine months flat, and then we couldn't convince anyone to take them. Right. So when I say that healthcare is unreachable, that's what I mean. Number one, we missed the mark. No one even acknowledged or realized that there needed to be an investment made in scientific communication 
and understanding and, and public health campaigns and all of these things that should have been done timely and, and in parallel and need to continue to happen. Um, and we continue to see that as a miss. But two, just the idea that we developed and and from a from a doctor's point of view from a science nerd point of view i got to tell you it was super cool it's super cool to see what we did with these mrna vaccines but we didn't make it reachable we didn't explain it we didn't explain it to the layman we didn't explain it in third grade level or sixth grade level language and that's where healthcare becomes unreachable because the reality is you shouldn't need a college degree and you shouldn't need a phd or an md to understand basic things about your health and about the human body. So we do have to do a better job of making science simplified and not just reachable, but relatable, right? Making sure, that's why so many people follow celebrities. They're relatable and they inspire you. And in many ways, science needs a PR campaign of its own. And we need to speak in simple language, not in lofty language that can confuse people and then actually make them very susceptible victims to miss and disinformation, because often when you don't understand something, but you get this really cool meme and this really neat TikTok that makes science seem so easy to understand, well, guess who you're going to follow, right? You're going to follow that influencer as opposed to the scientific subject matter expert that is not reachable or relatable. And remember, 59 million Americans still turn to social media influencers for their healthcare information. For exactly that. It's about the dance moves. It's about the TikTok videos. And it's that it's so reachable and relatable. Why why could you why would you not look away? Right? Why would you not? It's so engaging. It's incredible. You know, we we do a lot of studying of consumers and what you talked about in being unreachable, you know, I think it got so much worse during COVID, but we had times in 2018, 2019 where up to a quarter of the population in a given market, as we were surveying as NRC Health, couldn't name a hospital or health system. And yet when we would ask them other questions about how important it is or what your expectations are, you know, that's through the roof. Like healthcare is so important and it's so expensive and I need great access to great care. And yet I don't know a lot about my options for care. And then you throw in the wilderness of social media. I could not agree with you more about how there's all these all these pieces out here. And, you know, nobody looks at one meme or one image or one TikTok and probably changes an opinion, but they're ber- they're berated by it every day. And so it's this sort of death of a thousand cuts. I want to ask you about trust specifically because, you know, we hear across the country that we're a less trusting society. Some, da- some data backs that up, some doesn't. But I think specifically in healthcare, we obviously want, our would-be and future patients to trust us. As a physician, you want to trust your patients to do the things they need to do. Talk to me a little bit about trust with this backdrop of misinformation. Is there is there ways that we can build trust in 2024 <laughs> given all the all the things that are stacked against us? Absolutely. And look, trust is a really simple concept, which is that when I need you, you show up for me consistently and are always there for me. It's that simple, whether it is your retailer, whether it is your doctor, whether it's your family members, it's that I can depend on you and I know that you are gonna show up for me. That's number one, we as healthcare, we gotta show up for people. And we we have to build on the, the patient experience because that's the other thing. Every time you go to the doctor or the emergency room, a different experience and often not a great one. So to the extent provider groups, provider organizations are looking to one, understand what is it their patients are looking for, which is often a big part of it is simple access. And then two, being able to understand what what was said, what was given, what was the therapeutic, right? What was the diagnostic? What are the things I need to do when I get home? And then, hey, if I need you again, how do I get back here? How do I get back here? How do I get back in touch with you? So it's really focusing on the consumer engagement piece, but making it consistent because that's truly trust, right? It's knowing that that person is one, going to be available to me, but two, show up for me each and every time. And I can expect X, Y, and Z. It's so clear and it's so standard that I can expect X, Y, and Z from my doctor. So those are some of the things that I think provider organizations have certainly some work to do um, on, but that's what consumers are looking for. They're looking for that rinse and repeat experience. You know, it's so interesting too to hear you describe that because you know we're going through these access issues now, where people are waiting three months, six months, nine months for an appointment, and we're trying to find ways to solve those issues. And that's just a question of like, when can I get in? Trust is a relationship piece. I mean, it's built around experience after experience. And I come back to you, and we know that patients are healthier if they trust their doctor and they trust a healthcare organization, they've got someone in their corner. 
One of the pieces that gets talked about for solving some of these access issues is technology. Now, you have all kinds of different experiences with technology as a doctor, as a practicing physician, but also as an executive at tech places like Salesforce. So what's your take on technology's ability to improve patient care, to maybe improve trust? Some of these things we're really struggling with. Um, is technology going to help those efforts or is it possible it will hinder them? So I think that's really up to us. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of failed attempts with tech. You know that we're living in an era of physician burnout, staff shortages. And a big part of that is because we've implemented technology that actually slows doctors down, that actually interferes with the doctor-patient relationship. Now, on the flip side, if done well, absolutely, technology can help decrease administrative burden. Technology can help us understand our patients better. Right. So the opportunity to automate things that should be automated and leave the human factor to the actual practice of medicine and the bedside to be able to look a patient in the eye and not be so concerned about administrative tasks and documentation, frankly. So I think there's ample opportunity, but there's lots of lessons learned at this point of how we've not done this well. But that remains the opportunity. That's such an honest answer. And I, I chuckled inside because when you mentioned slowing doctors down, I mean, you can imagine every tech vendor. I mean, technically you worked for like one of the biggest coming in and saying, this will slow your physicians down by up to 15%. I mean, we're so hopeful when those technologies come out that this will solve an issue. And I really appreciate your, your honest answer about that. I had Paul Coyne of the Hospital of Special Surgery on last year on this podcast, and he made a similar analogy for artificial intelligence. So I've got to ask you about AI because he compared it to nuclear energy where you can, you know, harness this incredible energy and, and, you know, provide this energy to people and save lives that way, or you can destroy lives and you can use it as a weapon. And I, I think about that analogy quite a bit. And then I think about, you know, where we stand in 2024 with artificial intelligence. So I've got a doctor in front of me. I've got to ask you, how does artificial intelligence play a role in those challenges with technology? Well, again, and I, the analogy I like for AI is it's like electricity, right? It is really going to change the game and it has just ample opportunity and, and hopefully is more inspiring than, than the latter. But like any new innovation, we have to use it. So the same principles apply because when we first talked about electronic health records, we talked about CRM and healthcare. It was the same. It was supposed to be so revolutionary. It was going to, it was going to solve world hunger. Right. So AI is not going to solve world hunger, but it can solve some big problems in healthcare. If we think about documentation, clinical decision support, uh, automation, <clears throat> automation of, of, of the burden in healthcare, prior auth being one of the biggest ones. It saved billions of dollars and actually improve the efficiency of our clinical staff, from our doctors to our nurses. And hey, look patients in the eye again, which is what everybody wants, both the doctor and the patient. Now, if not used correctly, it could also propagate mis- and disinformation tenfold. If not used properly, it could actually get diagnoses wrong. It could actually try to replace the doctor, which is not what the patient wants, right? No one's going to the doctor tomorrow to have their baby delivered by, I say, R2-D2, right? So people go because they want someone they can trust. They know that there is an individual accountable and someone who knows me. And if they use great AI to do their job, fantastic. But there's that compliment that the human factor and the human understanding of that is really critical in, in healthcare because this is a business of humanity. This is, I have a problem. I have a cancer diagnosis. I have a life-changing diagnosis and I need to have someone on the other end of it. And I think that's the most important thing for us to remember is I think AI is extraordinary and the administrative burden is really where we should focus. If we try to focus on the human factor, it's just not the problem. The problem is we want the human factor and our staff and our hospitals are so burdened by administrative tasks. So why not take that out to allow the human factor and the human understanding to flourish, which is what everyone wants who's going into medicine or seeking a physician for a health problem. Well, the phrase business of humanity, I think, is, is so interesting. That's such a great way to, um, to describe healthcare, but also describe the challenges we face. And what's interesting about AI, so we've started to ask questions through Market Insights, our consumer uh, survey tool. We've started to ask questions about AI. And we asked uh, patients to make three choices. Would you like to just have care provided by a doctor? 
with no AI at all. This is just the doc in front of you. Would you like to have doctor plus AI? So this could be a doctor who's assisted by AI that's giving him other, giving, giving him or her um, readouts on what other patients are doing and assisting in certain ways. Or would you rather just have AI? We actually did ask patients, what if your doctor was like, not real? And that was the least preferred of category. Of course. But there was there was a fair amount of people, and we're still running some of these early numbers. There was a fair amount of people that were pretty excited about AI plus the doctor, or maybe I should say the doctor plus AI. And so I'm curious to you because I agree with you on the administrative piece. There's so many things we can do there, but let's say we have a pretty good run with AI helping us in those functions and in operations management. And then we say, okay, docs, we've got some AI tools that are gonna assist you. Where, where do you land on that as a physician? And where do you think in general in this country, physicians would land on the idea that they're gonna be supplemented by AI? I, I don't think doctors have a problem with technology, AI or otherwise. <clears throat> doctors have a problem with technology that slows them down or makes their job harder, which has been their experience to date. So what's really critical with AI or any technology as we think about EHR optimization, which continues to still play out, that clinical leadership is really key. So really understanding what the pain points of your physicians are, what your what your pain points of your nurses are, and then seeing if the application of AI can alleviate that, right? Number one burden right now for doctors and nurses is documentation. Any monkey can document. You don't need to go to school for 30 years to document. Throw AI on that, right? How to better, more efficiently document. Every doctor out there would be happy. It would take away from what we call pajama time. Clinical decision support. Look, none of us can know everything all the time. When I'm seeing a patient, particularly in my business as a rheumatologist, we see rare diseases and rare situations. Having the data available so I can make a clinical decision, but with support, with, with some support, with the latest data, the latest analysis of the data, I want the ultimate clinical decision to be made by me, but having that support, having that information available to me at the point of care, summarized quickly, consistently, but 100% accurately. So I say this because this is one of the concerns with AI, right, is we're still learning about hallucinations. We're still learning what this technology can and can't do. So being mindful that the final call needs to be the actual physician is really critical there. And prior auth, I can't say it enough. There is no physician in this world, there's no nurse in this world that enjoys doing prior authorization paperwork. And the patient on the flip side doesn't appreciate having to wait six to nine months to get an MRI or to get approved for chemotherapy. And so these are ample low-hanging fruit, but those are the things doctors welcome. Doctors welcome that across the board. Trying to replace the doctor is not going to be received well. And the idea that clinical decision-making should be done autonomously without the support of a human. We're just not there yet with the technology, right? I think we will get there at some point. But today, 2023, we're not there yet. We need we need to take the time to learn both what are the problems in healthcare, in medicine, and more about artificial intelligence across the board. You do a good job of crosswalking between some of the you know more corporate or organizational concerns about AI, and then also the physician's perspective, which we can both agree sometimes gets left out of the former and of those decisions. And so I appreciate that you pull those things together. And then let's talk about the other bond on the side of this, which is when a patient comes in to get that FaceTime with a physician. I agree with you. I think patients would love it if AI could take away pajama time and some of the busy, busy work and you have a fresher, more able to focus physician in front of you. Every patient would say, yes, give me that. What can we do in the meantime, as the technology improves and knowing it will eventually likely help, what can we do in the meantime? We have physicians who listen to this, but we also have a lot of people who are going to be patients. Is there things that physicians can be doing, even with all these challenges, to bolster their relationship with each patient? Absolutely. Look, I think the number one thing from a one-on-one -on -one patient care standpoint is to listen, right? And often the patient will be the one that tells you, you know, your office staff is really rude or I had to wait two hours for this appointment. The things that we're not getting as the doc from our teams, perhaps, listening to the patient, right? Asking them about their experience, inviting them to share what has worked, what hasn't, right? And then being a champion in your practice. I mean, so many providers now are part of bigger provider organizations. So being that champion to say, look, 
These are the ways we can cut waiting room time. These are the ways we can better understand our patients. Here's the technology we can use to <clears throat> understand so, so social determinants of health, transportation, religion, all the things that we actually understand are what determines if someone comes back to the doctor and or is actually even compliant with their medication. Again, going back to the COVID example, world innovative vaccine in record time, can't get anyone to take it, right? If patient can't get transportation to their pharmacy, can't get transportation to the doctor's office, chances are this is a one and done visit. So understanding that as a physician and really weighing into that and knowing your chief medical officer, weighing into the chief medical officer and saying, look, these are the things that I'm asked to do. They don't work. Here are some of my suggestions. And I'm I'm willing to be on a committee. I'm willing to take some leadership. I'm willing to work with tech. And also, here's the things I don't want tech to touch. As every organization is looking at AI, particularly in the provider communities, particularly around the ethics of the use of AI, having more clinical leadership is critical. And having and understanding our patients it goes hand in hand, right? The clinical leadership, the voice of the patient, they are connected and we often don't think of them and we certainly don't think of them as connected and they truly are. Because when you are touching patients every day, that's clinical delivery and that's what all of this business of humanity and medicine is about. And that's the core of that that bond between physicians and patients, which is human to human. And sometimes it feels like it's under assault, but what you talk about gives me Hope because it's reasonable. I think it's really reasonable. I don't think you said anything controversial in there. I think patients would agree. I think physicians agree. I think administrators would agree. It's just a matter of having it play out everywhere so we can make some changes. I, I want to shift gears because I'm not an expert on AI. I'm not an expert on physician patient care and the bond that they have. Um, but I did come up through marketing and in some of our uh, conversations beforehand and what I've seen you do and seen you speak on, um, you talk about a shift in marketing. In fact, you're very candid. You've mentioned in the past, sometimes administrators, and, and you've sat at the top level, have looked at marketing as kind of an add-on. It's a fun thing. It's cute. And uh, it's really turned into something else. So in 2024, where do you see the role of marketing in healthcare? Look, I think that marketing became so important during the pandemic. It was actually the first time I'll share with you at Salesforce. It was the first time the chief medical officer and chief marketing officer, it was the first time we met and we actually called it CMO squared. Now, why is that? Because we had to get people, we had to get our employees out of the office, into the office, vaccinated, mass. We had to educate them. We had to explain our benefits. There were so many things that became this natural partnership between marketing and medical that hadn't existed before only because we hadn't thought of it before. It's, there was always a natural synergy, but we really didn't connect those dots because in any organization, those corporate silos are, are really easy to sit in. And that same collaboration we saw across the board in our industry, whether you were a provider, a payer, a life sciences company. And the truth is we have to continue that because marketing in the era of mis and disinformation and in the business of medicine is patient education. If you are a provider and you are doing at-risk contracts, you are doing value-based care contracts, you have to educate people on why they should get a mammogram. What is a mammogram? So that they don't get breast cancer, right? If you don't have a marketing strategy for that, that's not going to happen, right? If you are trying to do patient engagement, if you are trying to ensure patient acquisition and retention, that is a marketing journey as well as a patient journey owned by the CIO or the CTO. So it's really important to connect those dots. And in healthcare, for whatever reason, we've always thought of marketing more as, hey, we're on the corner of third and fifth, we're open 24 seven, here's the insurance insurances we take. But the reality is if you're connecting marketing with clinical, it's way more powerful than that. And when people are having good experiences, experiencing good outcomes, they're never going to go follow someone else because, again, you've established that trust, you've shown up for them, you've understood where they are in their patient journey, and you've customized. You've customized the message. And so the more organizations that do this, the more success they'll find. I, I talk a little bit about this in my book in Chapter 8. Uh, Paul Matson, Chief Marketing Officer of Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic, just did an outstanding job of partnering Cleveland Clinic with YouTube. And he really owned the conversation. He he jokingly said, you know, I let my doctors be doctors. I just made sure they combed their hair, put them on camera. And I, and I did all the marketing stuff that marketing does. I didn't ask my doctors to become marketers. 
And it's, you know, it's few and far between that we, that we do that. We have to just let our doctors be doctors, but let the marketers do what they do best. And they're really good at it. And that powerful combination is really what will reach the last mile of our patients. CMO squared is like, I mean, you got to turn that into a white paper, at least. I love that. <laughs> I think that's a, it's a great way to describe a, a relationship that frankly, I think almost no organization is tapping into enough. And the key word in there is collaboration. And so I, I want to ask you about just collaboration overall. I mean, I think there's people listening to this that are in, in many different parts of an organization or outside of an organization on their own. And they're wondering, how do I collaborate more in healthcare? So this could be specialists between patients, between the doctor and the patient as well. But do you have any advice for just the broad audience on how to improve collaboration in healthcare? Well, look, it's about incentives. Everything is driven by incentives. So ensuring that physicians are paid for counseling, ensuring that the chief marketing officer, chief medical officer, CIO have common metrics, and they often do, like call them different things, right? Marketing has brand loyalty, uh, chief medical officer has EHR optimization, CIO has patient engagement strategy. It's all about patient acquisition and retention. So having that common metric is important and then incentivizing across that. And also obviously having a culture, having a company culture, having an office culture in which collaboration is expected, is admired and produces results. You know, showing mutual wins and having that, uh, showing those results once you are working on a project uh, of a consequence like that, I think it's important and highlighting that to encourage others and establish that culture. You know, and you mentioned culture, you mentioned loyalty. We've talked about trust today. Uh, interesting piece of data that's coming from Market Insights, our consumer survey. We do a trust index every year. And if you're a human being providing healthcare, if you're a doctor or a nurse or anybody in a white coat, you are more highly trusted than any institution. So we do know that consumers still place a high amount of trust and expectation on caregivers if they're a human being in healthcare. You know our mission is human understanding at NRC Health, and we talked a little bit about human understanding as well. Um, I will leave the last question with you, and I try to ask this of every guest as we conclude, um, but just you bump into someone in an elevator somewhere in Miami where you are, and you might have some tall some tall uh, towers there where you might have an extended <laughs> conversation. But I'm curious, they bump into Dr. G in an elevator and they want more human understanding in healthcare, just like you. What's a piece of advice you would give that other person to try to achieve human understanding in healthcare? That's a great question. I mean, the first thing I would say is, do you have a doctor? Do you have a healthcare person, whether it's a pediatrician, an OBGYN, cardiologist, whatever your health issue might be, is there a trusted doctor in your ecosystem? If there is not, it's important to get one. And virtual visits are a thing, especially if it's just a conversation. Taking the time to really understand who you are is fundamentally the most important thing that your doctor can know about you. So inviting that conversation and, you know, inviting the conversation of this is who I am. Uh, I'm a sport. I'm, I'm, I'm an athlete. I am a very religious person. These are the things I, I don't take blood transfusions or these are the things I eat. These are the things I don't eat, right? These are the things we're struggling with as, as a family in a multi-generational home. These can be some of the most insightful things that we can all value in human understanding, medicine, medicine aside, but they have direct implications on the choices we make as doctors or the recommendations we make for both therapeutics as well as lifestyle changes. And I would also invite you as a consumer or a patient to know your doctor as well. I think truly understanding who is taking care of you and who is being taken care of leads to a good relationship and it leads to better communication all around. I think at the end of that elevator ride, they would ask you if they don't have a doctor, which is your first question to them, they would say, are you accepting new patients, Dr. G? <laughs> I think they would appreciate having you as their doctor. I, I have a feeling you're pretty full, but um, uh, this was fantastic. I think you, again, can represent the physician point of view, the corporate and organizational point of view, and really the patient point of view as well. And so we really appreciate at NRC Health, your ability to sort of triangulate those things and bring them together to human understanding in the middle. Um, so I want to thank you so much for joining this conversation today. Absolutely. I hope to do it again. And I appreciate the work that you and the NRC team is doing. So thank you for that as well. 
Of course, we hope to continue as well. And your book, Dead Wrong, is out. Uh, we will link that to the description for everyone listening so you can hear more from Dr. G. And of course, we'll be back again in the future with another episode of Patient No Longer. Thanks for listening to our podcast today.